thank you, uh, thank you, John and Mayor. Thank you, and thank you for all uh, attending tonight. Um, I'm a recovering city manager. I, I uh, have the privilege of serving the city of Edina right next door for about 36 years, and being a sound mind, I retired about three years ago. And uh, part of what I've been doing is uh, helping ULI Minnesota with uh, with this program. You're the, I think it's the 21st city that we've done uh, navigating the new uh, normal workshop. In. You'd think we'd have it down by now, but every workshop we do, I think we learn uh, something a little bit uh, different about, uh, about the message that we're conveying. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors tonight. Minnesota Housing is our principal sponsor, and the Family Housing Fund provides some sustaining support. We also uh, receive some of the data that uh, Kathy will be presenting tonight from the uh, uh, Metropolitan Council and thank them for their um, support. Um, to give you a context for our work, everything we do at ULI Minnesota is based on partnerships. Uh, we're a district council of a larger 501c3 research and education um, association. Our mission is to provide leadership in the use of land and creative and uh, in creating thriving communities. Uh, ULI was founded in 1936 and we have over 37,000 members worldwide. Uh, our mission is grounded in developing, nurturing, and expanding relationships. Uh, we try to bring together public and private sector leaders across all political uh, boundaries for, uh, for collaboration on issues of regional uh, importance and we hope navigating the new normal is, uh, is an example of that. Uh, everything we do is through collaboratives, and with this in mind, ULI Minnesota has supported the Regional Council of Mayors uh, since its uh, inception uh, 2000, in 2005. And Mayor, thank you for your participation uh, in the Regional Council of Mayors. I think there are now 51, yes. 51 communities and mayors that, that get together uh, every month over lunch. Uh, there are no bylaws, no membership fees. And uh, they spend a couple hours each month talking about regional issues and, and are committed to uh, a, uh, a candid dialogue in a, in a nonpartisan setting. Uh, there are four strategic issue areas uh, for ULI Minnesota housing, jobs, transportation, and the environment. Each of those areas is guided by um, a task force that's chaired by a uh, ULI Minnesota business leader and one of the members of the Regional Council of Mayors. Anyway, that's, that's about us. What are we going to do tonight? There's really four parts um, to this workshop. I'll provide some context, talk a little bit about the new normal, share some national and statewide data that might be interesting to you. Uh, Kathy Bennett will then uh, provide some focus community change data that's particular to Richfield and the surrounding area. Many of you may already know some of the material that she's uh, going to uh, talk about tonight, but I think Kathy will put a little bit finer point on it and, and uh, do some care comparisons that maybe you otherwise uh, haven't seen. Then we'll turn to our panel of industry uh, professionals, hear what their view is about this thing we call the new normal and, and uh, what their take is. And then we'll have an interactive discussion with you. And by all means, when we get to the panel discussion, don't wait for the interactive discussion part to start. If you have a question or want to chime in on something the panelist says or have a question, jump right in. We, we're, we would prefer to keep this uh, as informal as possible. So what, what is this new normal we're talking about? It's, uh, it's a term used by economists, politicians, theologians to describe something that's happened to our economy, the future, maybe even the American dream. In fact, it was voted as the most overused term of 2009. Um, and uh, I think transparency ran a close second to, uh, to new normal. Uh, Colleen Carey, who uh, has been the chair of our advisory uh, board, has mentioned that it's now been <coughs> around long enough that we can stop calling it the new normal, we can just call it uh, the normal. The, uh, the Economist defines uh, the new normal as the persistence of underwhelming economic data, one characterized by diminished uh, work opportunities for a big swath of, of our population, even a scaled down American dream. Uh, new normals aren't a particularly new phenomenon. Uh, a quote I like is, uh, is this, we, 
we must realize it is not a temporary depression, but a new normal and adjust ourselves accordingly. It sounds like something we may have read in the paper uh, last week. Uh, it, those words were actually spoken by Mayor LaGuardia in 1939 to describe the new normal that was affecting the, uh, the country at that time. Well, what about this new normal? Um, what's different about this one? Uh, as noted by McKinsey, this new normal is shaped by a confluence of powerful forces some that arose directly from the financial crisis and some that were at work long before it began. Uh, this confluence of forces seems to be particularly impactful on development and redevelopment of our communities. Uh, first of all, uh, we're getting older faster. As uh, former uh, state demographer Tom Gillespie said, these things usually creep along at the speed of a glacier. Not so with aging in terms, uh, in demographic terms, this is a tsunami, it doesn't get much bigger than this. Uh, in the next 20 years, we'll add as many people over 65 as we did in the last four decades combined. And by 2020, we'll have many over 65 as we have children in kindergarten through grade 12. On a national level, to put it in perspective, in 1945, the United States had about 42 workers for each retiree. That's down to about three workers per, per retiree now. That's why so many of us are worried whether that Social Security program is going to be around when we get there. Um, who, who is this demographic that's, uh, that's, uh, in, uh, the, that's really starting to impact our communities? Well, they're the boomers, of course. The oldest of us are now uh, turning 65. Uh, Minnesota's hate aging has created or will create a dramatic shift in our households. Uh, during the past five years, households occupied by seniors or soon to be seniors have increased by over 130% in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. How is senior defined? Pardon me? How is senior defined? In this case, senior, I believe, is 55 and older. So it's seniors and those soon to be seniors is the way we've, we've described it. Some of us are soon to be senior a lot sooner than others are soon to be senior. I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> well, besides us boomers, who are the other big demographic that's influencing the built environment? Well, it's, uh, it's our kids, of course. These are the so-called Generation Y uh, group born between 1979 and 96. They make up about 30% of our population. They total about 80 million Americans, and they account for about half of all spending uh, in the United States. They're quite different from uh, preceding generations in a number of respects. They're the most digitally connected generation around, smartphones, Facebook, Twitter. They seem to be marrying later, having kids later. Uh, I don't know, I, I have three, three uh, Gen Yers in my family and uh, the comment they're closer to their parents than their boomers were, I think that's true in, in my family's case. Uh, they have high expectations of advancement, salary, mentoring. That may have been forced on them uh, in terms of job switches and, and the like more than they want to uh, change jobs uh, frequently. They want to live in urban environments. They desire walkability, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Well, what does this changing face of the country and the state mean to our, our communities? Uh, first, the boomers, they, they don't seem to be the rocking chair and canasta set of their parents and grandparents. They want activity, they want social interactions. More of them out of want or necessity continue to work after retiring from their day jobs. I'm, I guess I'm a pretty good example of that. Uh, they're looking for nearby employment opportunities, maybe uh, even some nearby office space. Uh, Starbucks, uh, the health club, bookstore are more attractive gathering places for, for boomers than, than the traditional senior center. Town centers with walkable nearby destinations and services are particularly attractive. They're much more transit savvy than, uh, than their predecessors. Well, what about our kids? That's where some really big changes uh, are occurring. Uh, they're much more interested in social connections. They're interested in walkability. They're willing to pay a higher price for it. In terms of work environments, individual uh, cubicles and offices give way to collaborative spaces 
an office of the future might look more like a Starbucks and it looks uh, like a traditional office. Uh, in 1985, the average amount of square feet in an office devoted to each employee was about 400 square feet. By 2011, that was down to 250 square feet, and by 2020, it's estimated to be down to only 150 square feet uh, per employee as people move out of the cubes into collaborative spaces. Gen Yers have more urban interests than their predecessors, especially places that facilitate connections, whether they be virtual, physical, uh, or social. About 18% uh, currently live downtown, or they would like to live downtown. About 30% would like to live somewhere in the city. Uh, urban places appeal to this Gen Y crowd. They uh, want to have cool places to hang out, text each other, fun restaurants and bars, places where you want to be. They're especially uh, interested in places that are walkable, aesthetically inspiring, diverse, have some transit availability. Yes, ma'am. I, I know a lot of these people. I'm active in my alumni association. Mm -hmm. I think this is incredibly true of college-educated people of that age. Mm -hmm. And I also know some people who are Gen Y aren't college grads, mm -hmm. and their lives are very different. They're very different. They're probably very threatened, too, aren't they? You bet. Yep. And so I read this, and I say, this is not universal. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that a bit with our panelists if we can, and, and I'll, I, I uh, welcome others to join in on that observation too, because I think it's true in many respects. Um, many uh, of this, uh, this group, as well as boomers, uh, prefer to rent rather than own. About 40% of apartment dwellers choose to rent for lifestyle reasons, and nationally there's been a rather dramatic shift from home ownership to rental steady growth in rental housing since 2004. Now with uh, the ch uh, improvements to the economy and with uh, the interest rate, what did I read today, two and a half percent rate on a 15 year mortgage, if I, if I have that right, perhaps that's going to swing the other way, but since 2004, certainly ownership rates have, have declined sub uh, substantially. Uh, what's the most important feature for Gen Y when it comes to their community selection process? Well, as mentioned before, uh, you know, being near transit, uh, wellness, uh, learning opportunities fit in, but again, by far the most important um, uh, uh, attraction for them in picking community is walkability. That seems to be a common denominator uh, of all this. It's interesting, too, that boomers seem to be interested in the same things, uh, many of the same things that uh, the Gen Yers are interested in. Well, these housing preferences of both boomers and Gen Yers are leading to a bit of a mismatch between the kind of housing we have in inventory and the housing desired by boomers and Gen Yers. And on a national level, there's been a rather dramatic shift between the supply and demand continuum uh, where it's projected there'll be an oversupply of the large lot uh, suburban environment compared to smaller lots. Um, how does the economy, the Great Recession, cost of commodities and all this figure in. Uh, the built environment uh, is estimated to account for about 35% of our economy. It was a big factor in the Great Recession. It was a principal victim of the Great Recession. Uh, the built environment's <coughs> always been a reflection of the underlying economy. Uh, Chris Leinberger at Brookings uh, points out the first version of, of the American dream was uh, the agricultural uh, economy, 40 acres and a, and a mule is what got the country started. That gave way to the uh, industrial economy where our drivable suburbs uh, had flourished. See the USA and your Chevrolet. But uh, a new economy has emerged, the knowledge and experience economy where information, education, creativity, and social connections uh, seem to rule the day. In addition to these underlying preferences of boomers and Gen Y, costs associated with drivable suburban economy are affecting our housing choices. Cost of energy, mainly gasoline, continues to outpace other expenses uh, in our lifestyle. And when we examine the impact of this on overall spending, the premium spent to maintain a drivable lifestyle becomes a major factor in housing preference. Uh, in fact, it's been estimated based on AAA that a typical car costs about $9,200 to own and maintain 
and that each car in the fleet, in the household fleet, reduces uh, your mortgage carrying capacity by about $100,000. Seems to me that uh, that situation puts the rich fields of the world in a wonderful position uh, for the future compared to some of, uh, of your farther out neighbors. Uh, in addition to changes being driven by housing preferences, uh, how is the Great Recession, in fact, in, impacted uh, the built environment? Well, from the private sector standpoint, changes to capital markets have created the greatest impact. Um, our panelists will talk a bit about this uh, in their comments. Uh, it's obvious, though, that the financial uh, structure of deals has changed in recent years increasing risk and making capital availability more challenging for the development uh, community. And again, I think they'll talk a bit about that uh, as we move into the panel discussion. Well, for cities, uh, modernizing infrastructure complicates matters. There's still roads to build, uh, schools to fill, water treatment plants uh, to build. Uh, our uh, panelists will discuss this in more detail, but in general, we believe that more successful cities will be those that provide a collaborative approach to solving problems, <coughs> identifying funding sources, uh, managing development risks, and improving uh, your decision-making skills. Uh, the impact on our cities as a result of the new normal are daunting and exciting. We'll turn to our panelists in a minute, but uh, Kathy, perhaps you can sh share some of the community change data. <coughs> Thank you, Gordon. Um, my role in this is to just take some of the national trends and relate it specifically to Richfield with some data that uh, we um, have. And Richfield's had the benefit of uh, having some of this data before because ULI participated in a program called the Opportunity City Program with Richfield. And so they had the benefit of some of this data but not um, all the way through 2011, which this is going to carry it through. So it, now the data has been from 2004 through 2011, so it shows kind of the downturn in, in the economy, but then also it shows a little bit when the economy is coming back and what's happening with where people are living, what housing types they're living in, uh, when they move, where are they going to, um, so it's a unique kind of set of data that's different than census. It's based specifically on parcel level um, information. Uh, so it's really pretty accurate, um, and it's not of a survey of information, it's actual counts. So um, again, I know that through this process, you've probably had a lot of data come at you, and I'm, again, going to put a lot of data in front of you, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. Um, We'll take some questions after, but really the meat of this navigating the new normal is having this information as a context in the discussion with the panelists, and that's really where you're going to want to focus your attention on. So uh, with that in mind, I will move forward. Uh, so this first slide is just taking um, the household distribution of Richfield by age from 2004 through 2011. And uh, what this shows is the change in the households um, during that period of time broken down by these different age categories. The largest household group, which is 37% of all the households in Richfield, are those who are middle-aged to baby boomers, 35 to 54. Overall, they experienced a decline of 9% during this time period, and that potentially could be due to those households aging into the next category. We call that aging in place. And particularly, I um, feel that this is probably the case in Richfield because the next age category, those 55 to 74, grew during that same time period by 21%. All the other age categories declined um, in total households during this time frame, with those <coughs> under the age of 25 uh, losing the most households um, at 34% during that period. Even though those under age 25 only represent 3% of all the households, uh, this is the age cohort that was likely hit the hardest by the economic downturn, and those most frequently in rental housing that have the um, ability to move uh, based upon uh, different opportunities and situations. But in addition, that age category that's uh, 35, 25 to 34, that's 19% of your household's population. That's 
stayed fairly constant, and that's the age group that really are the homeowners, and during that time is really when they're start, starting to try to make decisions about where am I gonna buy a home, where am I gonna settle? So you really, that has stayed fairly constant in Richfield, which is really positive. Another important factor that we talk about in this work is the change over the last 10 years across the metro area with regards to the growth and, di growth and diversity. In Richfield, approximately 30% of the population is non-white compared with 19% from 2000 census. This is similar to Minneapolis and Hopkins, but more than Edina, Bloomington, and Egan, but less than St. Paul. If you look at the smaller map on the right-hand side of the screen, it shows uh, that there are a couple of census block areas where there is a larger percentage of diversity. And the reason we show this is we feel that this is really important um, thing to consider now and in the future related to economic competitiveness. New Americans with multiple cultures are expected to continue to grow um, in the metro area and nationally. It is anticipated that the growth in New Americans will be a critical part of the economic future, economic competitiveness in the labor force um, in the future, particularly as um, uh, the baby boomers get older and move into the senior age cohort, there is going to be a need to fill jobs, and this is the age, this, a lot of that is going to be filled by uh, new Americans. So, Richfield as a city um, is very well positioned to attract this demographic group because it's close to Minneapolis and St. Paul and has a lot to um, offer and desire of uh, new Americans. Small, um, affordable homes, uh, single family, also rental housing opportunities. Wouldn't you say we're already attracting that demographic? What's that? Wouldn't you say we're already attracting that demographic? Yes. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it grew during that period of time. All right. No, actually, Richfield was um, identified as one of the most integrated cities in the Twin Cities area mm -hmm. by the University of Minnesota study. Yeah, that's About great. Two or three years ago. And that's a positive going forward because no question. Um, that's going to be a really important growth uh, for the labor force and for people uh, looking for where that labor force is going to come from. So no question. It's, we're just I, I think that our struggle is that we're not economically integrated. Right. And it's just also it's typically a white privilege thing. Would be very cautious. I'd caution you about your use of the term diversity because when you say something's diverse. Um, 100% African American or 100% uh, Latino is not diverse. Uh, typically, sure. white communities will say diversity meaning people of color. But I, so I'm seeing you say, um, instead of communities of color, you're saying diverse. So d differentiate between the two? Sure. Okay. And we didn't go into the specific detail of the breakdown of the people of color, and that maybe is very helpful feedback uh, for future programs. Thank you. So the next um, slide is about where and in what type of homes households are living in in the city of Richfield. The bar graph on the right is a breakdown of ownership versus rental homes occupied by all households, which is the blue uh, uh, bars, and then only those age 35 and under, which is the red bars. For all households, 66% are homeowners, 34% are renters. The renter and owner distribution is a bit different when isolating the younger age groups, 52% owning, 48% renting. However, in other programs that we've done in other cities, I've seen that that is much of a larger difference. And so what that tells me is that some of the younger households have a higher opportunity to own homes in Richfield um, because that is not as much of a stark difference um, compared to other cities that we have looked at. We also break this down by the type of home households are living in. For all households, 65% living in a single family detached home compared with 52% of the younger households. Uh, multifamily homes is very similar, five to eight and eight, eight uh, percent. Rental housing obviously is much more important housing choice for the younger age cohort than the households overall. Could you explain that little housing thing again. Is that owning multifamily or 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 renting? The that family? actually I'll um, this is just uh, it's not the little houses on the side. Yeah. Though that is not an owning or renting. That's just breaking it down by type. 
So this next slide breaks it down further and you can see those housing types by owner and renter to provide a little bit more context. And that's really why I show this. I don't spend a lot of time on it, but it just breaks the, deep, the same information down to more detail. Uh, we find that everybody likes to compare themselves to surrounding communities. And so what this slide is, is just breaking down the ownership and rental distribution uh, with Richfield and with surrounding communities and the county. <coughs> Overall, Richfield aligns with neighboring cities and the county overall, with the exception of Hopkins, which has more households renting than owning. Another key factor is where residents go when they move from the city, and this is one of the unique features of this data that uh, we have been using over the past several years. So with nearly 4,200 residents moving between 2004 and 2011, Richfield retained 23% of those moves. Comparing this to similar, the average across most cities that we've seen is about 20%, so you've been able to retain more than the average. Uh, what this indicates is that 23% of the residents who already live in the city are finding options when they move from one housing type to another. Some of the highest retention rate we've seen in some cities at 30 to 35% are typically cities that are larger, that have more diversity of housing options to move from one type to another. Um, and this means also that 77% of households are, are leaving the city when they move. So where are they going? Uh, Bloomington, 15%, Minneapolis, 14% are the biggest, <coughs> area, largest areas where they're going. I also looked at this for those households that are 25 and under because that was an age cohort that you were you were losing, um, and they, uh, the majority of those households when they were leaving Richfield, uh, they were, there was a higher percentage of those going to Minneapolis at 21%. So they're going to the city, um, probably closer to some of those amenities that uh, Gordon had indicated. Can you give me an example of a city you mentioned as high as 30% retention? Actually, uh, Brooklyn Park is a city um, that has a very high retention rate because they have a lot of opportunity for new <coughs> development, but they have some of the smaller um, single family homes and a fairly uh, a amount of large amount of rental housing as well. So there's kind of a, that whole range of different housing to be able for uh, residents to move to at different levels of their life. And you're saying that we're retaining 23% is 100% of that 23% people who are buying up or people who are needing to downsize? It's all. Is so it's right? not even so necessarily, not necessarily those buying. Right? It could be going from a rental to a rental. It could be going from an ownership to an ownership. It could be going from an ownership <coughs> to a rental, single family to single family. Any move. Any move. So it's not necessarily evidence that we are providing them the, the housing options that they're looking Right, the, they may be moving out because you're not providing the housing options that they're looking for. Or they're making a lateral move, or they're making a down move. Right, yeah. All those I, I, it's interesting you mentioned Brooklyn Park because I just had dinner last night with a friend who's married to a librarian and they live in Brooklyn Park. And she was talking about the tremendous pressure there is amongst, and that's a huge librarian, Nigerian population that's up there to stay close to their families, et cetera. I bet you that that has a significant uh, influence on why so many people internally move there. Well, and that could be um, in any case, in any community that you, I mean, and I think across all communities, what we've heard is when people move, they t and they are have, and when people move who have been in the community, they typically want to stay in or near their community. But for an immigrant, and in that case, most of many of them are refugees, mm -hmm. the pressure is even greater even more important. to retain their cultural uh, 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 unity. Yep. So now I'll shift a little bit to the distribution of housing values and what role that plays in providing options. And now this is only ownership, <coughs> single family, detached homes that we're providing this data for. Um, it's broken by uh, 
The reason why we break it down between 200,000 and 300,000 is that's what the majority value ranges are in the metro area. Now in Richfield, it would have been nicer to see a, you know, the breakdown lower than 200,000, but we didn't have access to that. So um, this is the same information we provide in the same categories as the other, um, other cities. So as you can see in Richfield, 75% of the single family detached housing, and this is assessed value, this isn't sale value, is under 200,000 with only 4% above 250,000. Um, in a moment, I'll show the median sales for 2012 across single family detached condos and townhomes so you can kind of compare that to this information. We all show, show this for those um, households in single family detached homes under the age of 35 and in Richfield it's really about the same as for all households. In other communities we usually see a starting difference here. Um, so uh, it, values are particularly important for those who are 35 years of age and under. So then what this shows is additional context related to sales and affordability. Uh, here we're comparing the median home sale price according to the Minneapolis Area Realtors Association for 2012 and we compare that to households who may be able to afford a home based upon the percentage of area median income in different uh, uh, wage categories and different uh, occupations. Um, I provided a handout that provides a little bit more detail on what, uh, what people can afford to pay in different occupations that you can have uh, for your uh, reading material um, later. In Richfield, the median sales price of a single family detached home is 164000 with townhomes at 139000 and condos um, at 68000 Now, I'm not sure why that is if some of your condos are older or maybe yes. some of them were converted from apartments to condos. No, it's just older. that they're older. Yep. And again, this is sales, so maybe not a lot of, there was only a few condos that sold and they were the more uh, lower valued condos as well. A lot of them are in senior buildings as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, as a point of reference, according to the 2010 census, the median household income in Richfield is 52,000. 12.8% uh, of people in Richfield are below the poverty level. Uh, this doubled from 2000 when it was at 6.3%. And in most cities, we've seen the poverty levels raise at <coughs> double or even sometimes more. So it's not an uncommon thing um, between the two census periods. <coughs> Looking more closely as income related to housing costs, this chart indicates that renters in the city are the most cost burden compared to homeowners with and without a mortgage. However, uh, in other cities that we've looked at, uh, the cost burden for renters uh, is typically a lot higher. So even though it's 54% are cost burden, um, we just did Chanhassen and it was like a 75% were cost burden. So um, Richfield has probably some, quite a bit of affordable rental options in the community. So I wanna shift gears a little bit here and talk about jobs um, and where residents are working. This first chart shows the growth and decline in total primary jobs in Richfield and I wanna point out that it's primary jobs. Um, so if a person holds two jobs, this is only counting one job that they own uh, or that they hold. Richfield has experienced a consistent growth in jobs since 2005 with the exception of 2007 and 2008, which really was the, the, the biggest decline in jobs uh, based upon the economy. Sorry, when you, you did this, um, when you were pulling this data together, did you use specifically within the boundaries of Richfield? Yes. Or did you use a five mile radius or something? Nope, like this was specific to Richfield. Yeah. Uh, for all years, there was a total growth in primary jobs of just over 2,600 uh, jobs. The main, five main industry uh, sectors of, of employment in Richfield accommodation, food service, educational services, retail trade, et cetera, all except for management of companies um, increased and um, administrative and support waste management increased significantly. That may have been that 
in 2005 there wasn't that many of that type and a company came in and that's why that percentage is so is elevated so much uh, what this chart shows is that Richfield really has a balance of the inflow of workers and the outflow of workers um, in many communities uh, their community may be a bigger exporter of jobs and and or in other communities it may be the other way I this is really pretty even um, in Richfield um, so you have a slightly um, you're a slight net net exporter of jobs meaning that there's more residents going out of Richfield to work than there are jobs and a thousand residents both work and live in the city meaning they, they hold jobs in the city. Looking closer at the data, where do Richfield residents work and where do their employers in the city get their labor force from? The top part of the chart is the labor pool, the number of jobs in the city, and where employees come from for those jobs. With nearly 15,000 jobs in the city, 7% of those jobs are held by Richfield residents which is lower compared to other cities we have studied through this work. The average is about 11 to 15%. The largest percentage of employees come from bordering cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Bloomington. The um, commuting on the flip side, there is about uh, 1,600 residents working. It can be assumed that 93% of those residents commute to work, 22% go to Minneapolis, 13% to Bloomington, et cetera. Yeah, it's like the, you might have a question. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. Well, what, these figures here, does this not take into the consideration the recent huge uh, layoff that um, Best Buy has had, or is Probably this prior? Probably not. This is that. Yeah. This is prior. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's that was 800 jobs right there. Boom. Yeah, this is 2011. Yeah. So it, it probably didn't. Did you have a? Just, Oh, well, I was wondering, do, do you have any data that shows who's commuting as far as, are people commuting, leaving Richfield to go to retail blue collar jobs? Are people coming into Richfield for management position jobs? I mean, you know, so what's the... You know, the data can be broken down that way. That would be really helpful um, in the group. context of this workshop, we don't get to that much detail, but certainly um, I can provide <coughs> the staff with all of the information as to where I got this data and they can um, delve into it and look at that. Yeah. Do you know if any of the data contained a uh, percentage of folks here on a work basis? Boy. Knowing, I, knowing the labor pool. Like I don't know the answer to that. That's by Paramount. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to look. So, and finally, uh, last slide. Now we can get into the discussion. Um, this is really a, a breakdown of a little bit more detailed breakdown about the workers, your resident workers, not the labor force. So just so we're clear about that. The major industries for resident workers as a whole are healthcare, retail trade, and accommodation and food service, with 44% making more than $3,300 per month in primary wages. However, there's 27% of your residents who are under the age of 30 who are working. 34% of those are making a primary wage less than $1,251 per month, which is less than $15,000 per year. Not a sustainable income to rent, buy a home. So those uh, residents likely are rooming with someone else, hold multiple jobs, or are part of their <coughs> income. Uh, 44% of those under the age of 30 are employed in retail trade, accommodation and food service, and healthcare. So with that, um, this slide is just a summary of kind of both the information that Gordon and I talked about, um, the impact of the new normal, and things for you to consider as we get into the panel discussion. Any other kind of burning data questions that you want to clarify before we move forward? Great.
Okay, thanks, uh, Kathy. This uh, is the part that I enjoy is uh, the panel discussion. I want you to jump in uh, too. Don't uh, don't be reticent to do that. But I get to play the the Phil Donahue part, I guess. But somebody mentioned the other day that when I say Phil, the Phil Donahue part, I am showing that I'm more of a boomer than a than liar. That probably 90 percent of the people in the room won't recognize that name. So. Maybe Jerry Springer. Yeah. 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 Maybe not. No, no. Um, John Breitinger, maybe I can lead off with you. Um, where, where does, uh, it's kind of a long question, but where does Richfield fit into the metro area marketplace? Uh, what, from your perspective, what sort of projects are realistic here? Is, is luxury housing a possibility? Is mixed use a thing of the past? Kind of a long question. But <laughs> where, where do we fit? Where does this town fit in with the uh, with the metro area? Well, so um, by way of background, um, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, good. Yeah. They, we, still, we will have to pass the mic back and forth. I think. So, yeah. Um, Let's see, where was, okay, so most of the work that I do is um, commercial in, in nature, retail in particular, and sort of follows housing. I think Richfield is, um, is blessed in many ways. It's, it's situated between the two densest employment centers in our region, and it's very proximate to both, uh, with downtown containing the most jobs, and it's a very easy commute to downtown and um, the southwest um, complex being the second, um, you know, it, it has a terrific um, grid of streets and blocks, so it's, it's a place, uh, I mean, it's been built out for a long time, so in my world, development means redevelopment, um, but it's a good, a good place to work. You have great density, um, great connections to everything, and um, you know, really all of the things that we look for um, is, uh, what was the second part of that? Mixed use. Well, mixed use, uh, you know, is, have we seen the, the last of uh, great mixed use projects? Are they I don't think so. I mean, I, th I think that, that um, uh, Richfield is, is actually um, getting and has gotten for many years um, uh, more of that than, than many other suburbs. Um, you know, if so you look at the retail world, there's sort of three big um, forces that, that are impacting it, the, the economy um, and demographics and technology. Um, starting with demographics, you know, the, the, for the first time in my career, which is about 35 years, the baby boom is no longer the, the driving force in, in the commercial business. Even though there's a lot of wealth concentrated there, um, we're spending less, we don't need as much, um, and frankly we've run out of places to put stuff. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, this, this new, the, the Gen Y is now the dominant demographic cohort in, in terms of uh, uh, just numbers of people, and they're shopping very differently. So. Um, Merchants are having to figure out how to um, how to serve a much more diverse customer base in every way, um, but but the, just the demographic trends really um, belie that. The the economy, you know, has is also significantly diminished uh, consumption, and for for many many years, uh, I think it's been. A combination of the wealth effect of seeing you know, rising asset values and and declining uh, interest rates, you know, people were buying more and more stuff, and Wall Street was funding a lot of that expansion in retail, and so places became more and more alike. You know, the, the, it was easier to fund a project if it was, you know, if it fit neatly into the categories that everybody wanted to buy. We're seeing a huge shift in that regard, and I think that um, there, there's still a little bit of conflict between what we crave in a public place and how we really live. Um, if you talk to people around the region about the commercial districts and the shopping that they like, all of the qualities that we've talked about in mixed use would be very high on the list of places that people like. But we're all still getting here, uh, 
high, high percentage of us are still getting here in single occupancy vehicles, and a lot of them are SUVs and, and, and minivans, and so, you know, parking is, is a bit of a constraint. Mixed-use development is, is very challenging. Um, it, it's hard to uh, match up the needs of two different demand cycles, um, but, I, but I don't think it's a thing of the past at all. I mean, I think we're simply <laughs> just facing the reality of, of all of these changes. Um, luxury housing, you know, I think that, that people want to live um, close to work, close to amenities, um, and I, I think Ridgefield is very, very well situated in, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I guess I would defer to more of a housing expert on, on the, the luxury part of it. Jumping back to the, the mixed use, what, what's the challenge? Is it that uh, people are reluctant to, to finance those, those two different uh, markets in the, same, in the same loan transaction? You know, it's a combination of things. Um, that certainly is a big part of it. Um, capital is, is tougher to come by. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's really all about how do, you, how do you accommodate two very different needs in one place. And um, the, the places that we all love the most, you can't build anymore because <laughs> our, our code prohibits it. Um, you know, I think of 50th in France or any of the great streetcar intersections in, in Minneapolis um, that, that people all love. Um, you can't do that today. You, you simply can't. Um, we, we did a project, um, first phase of a project at uh, Penn and American uh, just outside of Richfield and had very, very clear mandate from all of the policymakers in the community. We sat down with the engineers and they said, this isn't going to happen. You know, our job is to move as many cars through here as we can. And so, you, so balancing the needs of, of a resident with the needs of a, of a, a guest are, are just very challenging. But um, more and more, you know, Best Buy isn't building 40,000 square foot stores anymore. They're building 5,000 square foot stores. And you have a great example of one of those just that way. Uh, today, our codes demand much wider streets, um, much bigger uh, clearances. You have to be able to get a fire truck anywhere. Um, parking codes, um, uh, John, you deal with that every day. Um, but it's just everything. I mean, you know, it's, you, you look at the volume of activity. And 50th in France is a great example because everybody knows it and every, everybody says, you know, that's what we want here. Um, but you, you can't do it. John, maybe you could also just speak to the parking requirements of both financiers and tenants as well. You know, I think from, from our perspective, we're far more focused on what works than what somebody will finance. Um, I don't think financing has ever, ever been a constraint in, in that regard. Um, but it, 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 and, you know, this is changing. Um, it's, it's changing very quickly, um, but you have to build, you, it has to work today. If, if it doesn't, I mean, most of the failed mixed-use projects that we see are the ones that struggle in some way. Uh, often it's because the parking is difficult and, and doesn't work. Um, there are places where, where people will tolerate something that's less than ideal, but um, if you want good development, you want to attract good development, you have to find ways to reduce risk. And, and um, that's a very risky proposition. Jay, I don't know if you have any, any comment you can make on the luxury housing component. I don't know that you do a lot of that uh, sector necessarily. We don't, but from my redevelopment days in Minneapolis, the, the challenge is, is to create that environment where people would want to because you know, everyone, when you, when you start spending a large amount of money for housing, your choices get quite a bit broader. And, and you're oftentimes not precluded or not focused on a single neighborhood. You're looking, if you're going to spend $700,000 on a condo, you're going to look around all of Hennepin County, not just one city. 
So it's not unusual for somebody who lives in Edina or Bloomington when they're looking for condos to end up downtown Minneapolis. Now, that same person would never go to St. Paul, or very unlikely to go to St. Paul, because <laughs> it's like that river is 10 miles wide. <laughs> so, so there's those kinds of things. And, and luxury housing, like when we redeveloped Loring Park in Minneapolis years ago, a half of Lo Loring Park is half subsidized housing, and no one realizes that. They all think of the condos being really nice and things, but it's really half project-based Section 8. And the challenge was to create that environment that people didn't feel like I'm with those people, but I'm with the higher end condos. And so you had to put in the amenities, you had to do the greenways, you had to extend the Clip Mall, you had to kind of get the Skyway system to go that far south to attract the first condo. And the first condos were ugly. A 1200 on the mall is an ugly building. I hope no one's associated with it. <laughs> um, and, and the further along you got, the better looking they got and the more value they had. Because the pioneers are always the most challenging ones, and you won't get the big bangs with the pioneers. And that's it's just creating that environment along areas of high amenities. So, there, so there's hope in Richfield for, for mm -hmm. some luxury housing. It, it's just, uh, again, talking about broader marketplace, recognizing the competitive environment for luxury housing is much broader than just within the city. Or but but the it gets into more than the market. Um, we're in a building senior housing communities around the metro area. We've got our plan to build between six and ten in the next few years. And we're very specific on where we're going to build. And these are projects between 20 and 40 million dollars each. And, and the, the, there are three things that, that's, that we look to cities, because there are some cities we won't do business in. I don't care what the demographics say, because you'd never get out of there alive. Um, having clear priorities. You know, when you talk about luxury housing, when we did Loring Park in Minneapolis, the city went out on a limb and sold general obligation bonds to clear out, now that was back when you could do condemnation, uh, clear out Loring Park. And for years, the city had to levy mill levy because Loring Park took longer to develop because the times were tough. And a number of people lost elections because of it, but now it, tur you know, it turned out great. But having clear priorities, there's a clear priority we wanted high-end housing and hotels and stuff. And that the priorities matched reality. Because we all go right around the metro area and, and 50th in France analogy pops up in half a dozen communities at any given moment. <coughs> and the reality doesn't match the priority. They may want a priority to have 50th in France, but the reality of trying to replicate that is just so that the priorities have to match reality. And the third thing is the staff and the policymakers have to be in alignment. There's nothing worse than if you've gone into cities and the staff, yeah, yeah, we just love this project. And we hit the planning commission and they're cold and we hit the city council and they're frigid. And you know, you're, that just, word gets around because we all talk. Um, it, it's a, and I'd say adding to that thing in addition to the market thing is really trying to get those three factors in alignment because then if you have those priorities, you're more likely to get somebody stepping forward and saying, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. If I could add a comment. I mean, what Jay said is really important. I mean, you know, there are far fewer of us developers today than there were six years ago. And um, uh, <laughs> it, it, pursuit cost and, and risk are, you know, a very, very big deal in determining where we're going to invest our time and, and energy. Um, I mentioned this project at uh, Hen and American that, that Catherine's involved with. Um, that was one of the hardest things we've ever done. The city of Bloomington was absolutely committed to it um, from, from day one and helped in a bunch of different ways. At the same time, we were having some experiences in a couple of other um, first tier suburban communities where we saw terrific de market demand for, for good projects. And we had the exact experience that Jay talked about. We spent, in one case, $700,000 in, in pursuit cost, assembling a site, going through uh, planning, feasibility, um, only to, to end up in a deadlock situation between all the, the policy makers. And, and as a company, you know, we've determined we can't, can't do business in that, that environment anymore. I've heard some people say on past panels that um, a, uh, a uh, fast no is better than a slow maybe. Is oh, that absolutely. Is that, yeah. is that a good way to, to describe it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, ma'am. I was curious. You mentioned you're looking at doing some senior housing, and you have certain criteria. What are your criteria? What are you looking for? Um, we look, you know, at the demographics. You know, what the age group is, what their incomes are, what the competition is today, um, the need for uh, affordable assisted living. We try to do affordable where we can. Um, just because it's our policy to try to do it. We did it in Eden Prairie, worked really well. We did it in Minneapolis, worked really well. Didn't work so well in Edina, the affordable piece. <laughs> well, we got some, we had some units. Gordon kept me out of the fan on that one. Um, so, I mean, those kinds of things you look for. Particularly as you look at the demographics and, and realize the number of seniors in 2020 and the income they have to support um, living in assisted living, because assisted living, you know, is, is uh, about 3200 to $4,000 a month. And, you know, most people sell their homes, I mean, a lot of people sell their homes and have their savings, and that gets them through uh, assisted living, and the average length of stay in assisted living is four years. So you just do those math and... Can I, can I just interject, you know, we have an aging population, and we've done senior housing, and it's great because a lot of those people them down at the community center and they moved into Richfield and that's a great thing. But then we have all these aging baby boomers, I'm one of them. They'll move in and out of that housing and then we have that housing because the next group is not as large as this. What's going to happen with that? What's going to happen with that housing? Well, the, um, we used to, first time home buyers are a huge stock because your housing stock, if you look at the first time home buyers that are out there, and the, and the purchase price of your homes and as they drive through the neighborhoods, we always worked really hard to have first time home buyers in Minneapolis, where we would take um, not only the ability to have a mortgage, but the ability to put additions on and upgrade the house when you purchase it. Because a lot of financing today, you can get into the house and they make sure it's code compliant, do the <coughs> inspection, but they aren't gonna do the addition, they aren't gonna do the upgrades when you go in, particularly at today's record low interest rates. And that's where we as a city decided back then to get involved so that those first, so you could attract those first time home buyers to come in and, and get a great first house and a great value <coughs> and have it really look new when they're done. But I'm not talking about the housing stock, that's exactly what we're doing. I'm talking about the senior housing that's gonna be empty when all the baby boomers finally age out mm -hmm. as a way and we have all these high rises that are specifically for aged, yeah. and now they're for seniors, and they have assisted living in them, but there aren't enough people to fill yeah, when, when Gen uh, When Gen X yeah. comes mm -hmm. through following the boomers, yeah. are, there are not enough that is to fill out these projects. Our statistics show that's about 40, 40 years from now. Right. Yeah, well, we we'll still have those buildings around. A lot of these buildings are still around. Some of these houses go back to you know the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, these houses, these, these buildings will be around. Right. Who's going to inhabit them? Well, the question would be is, what's the average stay in that housing then, too? Instead of four years, could it be six years or eight years? And then the second question is, what's the population of the metropolitan area going to be at that time? Exactly. Well, this, uh, this comment is somewhat related to Mayor Vitale's uh, thoughts, I, I think. I don't think you put words in your mouth. But uh, I was on the planning commission a number of years back, and one thing that we heard about is there was a plan kind of on the table for a new seniors development. And the fact came up that some of the senior buildings we have in town, there was actually quite a large vacancy rate. And they, they said that, well, the problem was, is that your 60-year-olds don't want to move into a building with 85-year-olds. So it seems like senior housing has kind of a short uh, shelf life. It, it depends on the, the, the difference. With the, 80, the average age in assisted living in Hennepin County is 85. So the, the people who move into those co-ops on uh, Lindale, they're probably, and I'm going to guess because I don't really know other than circumstantial information, they're probably 65 to 70, 75. They're kind of in that age range because they're more independent. The, the assisted living, the typical assisted living person doesn't drive anymore. And, and they're, they're staying in other locations longer today because of the cost differential go from that housing to assisted living. So you're right, there is a, there is a differentiation in a senior housing from you know, the, the senior co-ops, senior apartments, senior condos to assisted living. What are we going to do with them, though? In some ways, some of them, they could be retrofitted to, to add, if you added commercial kitchens and you added kind of the wellness features, a lot of them have a lot of amenities already. 
that if you added commercial kitchens and some of the uh, nursing stations and things, you could retrofit some of them for assisted living. I'm not sure high rise works well for assisted living. We Again, don't that do that. Some of them have already been retrofitted for memory care and some of those things, so that they can do more. But again, after they're gone, and Yeah, I'm more of a you, I'm sorry, I'm go so ahead. When you, when you were planning to build an assisted living <clears throat> development, you must have a, an expectation of lifespan for the building. What would that expectation be? 50 years. Okay. Many times it will pass that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just as you think, you know, usually we think about two years, I mean, just to get through the process. But, yeah. um, you know, 50 years is, is really, because the part of it is, is you, you know, you start, doing statistics, you go back five years ago from now, go back just five years and think of how we were all thinking five years ago and that first of all there were more of us around and and we are thinking differently than we are today. I mean today's pro yeah, our apartments are like 70 years old. Yeah. Debbie, I was just thinking about uh, you know, what are we going to do with these? A lot of people are going to flip it. Um, you know, many of those buildings right now are age restricted. The possibility of lifting the age restriction and Gen X that doesn't have the kind of, uh, you know, uh, prejudice <coughs> against uh, multifamily housing might want to move in there after they become, you know, or whatever their circumstances. They have to be renovated inside yeah, as well. Yeah, that's right. They have to be renovated. It's a cost Flip effective. It. Get rid of the age restriction. Well, they're not doing that now. I mean, with a lot of our apartments are not renovated now. Yeah, that's a real problem. It is. A lot more one bedroom. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a huge problem. Yes, sir. They typically, I mean, I work in SHIP with the State Historic Preservation Office. We do a lot of reuse studies. And uh, one of the things that what does worry me is it, it, the assisted living houses typically roll into, into institutional housing. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more about this is what reuse has been. Um, and where maybe one senior complex might not be bad, but when you have five of them grouped together and that's all they can be used for, it becomes a problem. Because then all of a sudden, you're creating a institutional living in one area. Yeah. So it and, could be a problem. And you're also creating a bubble that nobody really wants to penetrate um, if they're not of that demographic. So I, I think, I mean, we were talking about diversity earlier. Uh, diversity will beget diversity, and that's you know, that's what you want. That's a great thing. It's great that what Richfield has that. I'm talking about all kind, all kinds, socioeconomic, socioeconomic, and age more than race and ethnicity necessarily. Mark, you had a, did you have a follow-up? Well, I think questions are really important questions. Um, my sense in working with a number of communities is uh, we could we can we can analyze to the point of being paralyzed mm -hmm. in some of these areas. So, for example, we could ask if I'm the city of Roseville, why do I want all this retail? Because nobody's going to shop in 30 years in buildings; they're all going to do it online, right? <laughs> I mean, so you know that's. I hear that sometimes from cities who are concerned about the number of big box and what are we going to do with all of those. Facilities. I think the communities that I see that are pretty vibrant are the ones who are more concerned about what am I going to do in the next 10 years in order to make my city an attractive place for both residents and for commercial. And I would submit to you that one of the things that I learned um, a long time ago being involved in projects in Richfield on redevelopment is one of the reasons we do these senior housing projects so that we do retail is to provide incentive and confidence on the part of our single family homeowners. That this is a good place for me to invest my money in my home and to recommend to other people that they should live here as well. And so that's the conflict we have when we start thinking, and it's, I don't envy you, those of you who are on the city council, because you have to make those tough choices between thinking about what happens over the next five or ten years to my community, and what happens in 40 years. In 40 years, all of your baby boomers, seniors, probably are going to be dead. Um, if you look at those demographics and we're 
we're moving 13 years from now, the uh, first wave of baby boomers will reach uh, age expectation. Although that seems to also be a moving average. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I think that complicates it as well. Uh, is somebody who is 70 even going to want to consider moving into a building that's uh, occupied more and more by somebody who is uh, above 85 uh, and we all seem to be staying more and more active so as you start making these decisions about what housing needs are going to be you've got to take up all of that into consideration as well it's not unusual to look at the Sunday paper, go through the old bits, and there are a boatload of people who are 90 years old who are just now dying. Well, shoot, they should have died 12 years ago. We're kind of advancing this, this uh, age. And if you look at the activities of people who are 75 and 80 and, and even above, we're starting to be much healthier and much more active. And so the, the senior housing that we thought of before for people who are going to be sedentary just may not be the ticket. And, and even if I can add that, even if you look at the assisted living we're building today, is not the assisted living that was around 10 years ago. Right. They're a lot more active, a lot more wellness focused for people who want to thrive and, and enjoy their life and not just sit in front of the TV screen. So Jay, that's kind of interesting that you said that now, I know you're in the city. Uh, the assisted living and the independent living over in North Minneapolis, right behind the old used to be months and where building. Mm -hmm. I've been through that. You've been through that. And, and so they have the independent right beside, I mean the assisted living and the uh, independent living right beside each other. And I have a, a friend out there that I visit and, and some of them were just moving from one building to the next. Is that kind of common throughout the city? I mean, it's happening more. It doesn't necessarily have to be, if you think of a neighborhood more, you could have the senior, the Lindale senior housing and then assisted living nearby, which you do with the Pines, where you kind of have that natural progression right in, in one area. I have to report my mother lived at City Bella and moved to the Pines. There's a question right here. Yes. Uh, Two-part question, maybe Jay, you alluded to earlier about uh, the development community having certain perceptions about different places where you do business. How is Richfield perceived as a place for developers to do business and build projects as far as working with uh, the city? You know, I haven't. I, I'm trying to think if I've done anything in Richfield. I, I don't think I have, but, but um, <coughs> you know, I, I think generally positive. Um, a couple of close colleagues who have done um, multiple projects here, and I think it's good. And for, from a senior housing standpoint, be positive. The challenge is, in, in fully developed cities, anything we do is redevelopment. And, and to know that there's a policy that if, if suddenly Rich, if, if Richfield came out and they said, geez, we really want to do this type of redevelopment project in this type of location, you'd attract people like us because it is so central to all the different areas around it. Let's go ahead. Uh, kind of as a follow-up to that, uh, I was reading in the ULI Opportunity City Report, which I would recommend to all the Housing Visioning Task Force folks to read. I think it's a pretty balanced, comprehensive report that really sums up a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, talks about the potential to accommodate development of up to 5,400 new housing units by 2030. And so just to get your perspectives on smart ways to do that and kind of back to that comment of desire with reality, you know, what, what kind of, what's going to get done? Or what could get done? Well, I think what's the, how, how many, uh, an addition how many units? Uh, 5,400 5, by 2030, so in the next 18 months. The, the challenge with those, when they go out that far, it's a little bit like Mark said. You, we ne you never look at because, you know, every, every city needs a lot more apartments, including Minneapolis, which is currently being overbuilt. And, and so you look at the, between now and 2030, they need another 3,000 apartment units, and I wouldn't build the market rate apartment unit downtown if they gave me the land. 
um, right now. Um, so it's, it's looking at that time frame and the specific locations because there are areas that would be great for senior assisted living in Richfield and that would work well in the neighborhood and there are some that don't and they, you know, the same is true with commercial or office or any other reuse is, is from a community standpoint, what's your first, what are your two, three priorities? And I guess maybe dialing it back to let's say the next five years, uh, I'm more interested in the kind of that, you know, talking about that uh, reality versus the you know community desire, however, whatever you want, however you want to phrase that. But you know what I guess what is the what is the reality today for developers of the types of deals that are getting done and make sense? Um, well, I, I mean, I'll speak to that from a commercial standpoint. Um, uh, it's the the vast majority of it is adaptive reuse. Um, you know, if you look at our world from sixty thousand feet, you'd say we don't need any more retail. Um, and there are only a handful of um, tenants who are expanding and, and are sufficiently productive to support the cost of new construction given today's land values and the fact that you're typically reusing, uh, you're tearing down something that worked at some level before. Um, but I, you know, I kind of talked about the three big forces. I mean. Stores aren't going away. You know, there the, the are sort of four things that you need stores for. One is convenience. Um, people uh, don't want to drive very far to buy milk or gasoline or go to the bank or get their hair cut. Um, and so, as, um, so that's a big deal. And that has a lot to do with the perceived desirability of a community, the availability of, of quality services of that kind. Um, Service is, is a big deal. In, in many businesses, I mean, there's, a, there's an element of um, sort of expert interaction required that you can't deliver over a wire. And even though um, the buyer's journey today, I mean, used, when I used to buy a bike, I'd go to a specialty store and I'd start by seeing what was there and talking to an expert. Today, I connect with a community of people like me online first and see what they think and then I do a little bit of research and you know by the time I get to the store I still I still want that interaction um, I still want help fitting it I still want service but um, but it's a different journey you know I've, I'm coming in w with a, a, a list of questions you know something in mind already probably a price <laughs> limit um, Experience is a, is a really big deal. Um, and I think that uh, for many, many products and services, the, the physical environment is a big part of that. And then finally, um, it's community. You know, people, and especially the more high tech our world gets and the, the, you know, our households are getting smaller, more of us are living alone, um, you know, we just want to go out and be with other people. And so the, the, the role of commercial is is changing, and it's not it's not going away, but it but it needs to adapt. So, you know, we look for lots of customers. We look for infrastructure that will support um, whatever it is that we're we're trying to do, um, parking, you know, transportation, all all of those things, and um, um, you know, I think that uh, Richfield has many great examples. You know, I look at the hub, and and the hub has been reinvented three times in, in my career. Um, but it has very strong fundamentals. You have you know, good infrastructure, um, great density, and you know, it, it keeps, keeps getting reinvented. John. I've had occasion to be on these panels five times, and, and John made the point earlier, but I want to just emphasize it. And I want to connect the dots a little bit to the work that the Visioning Task Force is doing. Um, John talked about risk. And, and Jay also talked about how developers look at development opportunities and assess what's it going to take to get through this, how much, how much time is it going to take, what's the, what's the relative certainty that we're going to get what we want at the end of that. So having a clear vision about what the city wants in terms of housing is the first step in that process. And then aligning your codes and ordinances to make it easier to do what you want than what you don't want. And the mayor, uh, the mayor of Chicago to talk about make it easier to do better. Um, and the other piece of it, I, I work with a lot of cities, and I often hear when we do community <coughs> engagement, 
Why can't our community be more like X? Why, why can't we be more like that? And what I frequently see is they, they want to be like them, but they don't want to necessarily make the investments that those cities make. And I've heard Mark talk about it before and, and maybe just ask him to follow up on this. One of the things about the new normal is, first of all, there aren't as many developers as there were. Their margins aren't what they were. Financing is harder to get. And so managing risk, make it clearer what your expectations are, and then being ready to make strategic investments in alignment with that vision, I think could be really, really key. So Mark, I've heard you talk many times about, about how the new normal fits into what cities may need to do if they're trying to encourage a specific type of development. Sure. Um, so, you know, one of the projects that when we talk about mixed use that everybody holds up is Excelsior and Grand over in St. Louis Park, right? Everybody, I shouldn't say everybody. People in Minnetonka don't like, they don't want to be like Excelsior and Grand, but a lot of other places do. Um, but we have to remember that, how did that project get done? Well, the city went and bought all that land, okay? The city paid a lot of money for that land and didn't get paid much for the land. Okay. Uh, and they went through and had probably the preeminent developer at that time, actually two of them, one was a real estate investment trust who were experts in mixed use and they you know, lollygagged around for a few years and the city finally walked away from them and had to go find another developer after having invested all this money. Um, and then started out with a project which was going to be almost all apartments and then the condo market and selected a developer based on that and then the condo market all of a sudden took over and they had to work with this developer to, who didn't know how to develop condos to actually build it. So, and on top of giving the land for a reduced amount, they had to give the developer in order to park, build the structure parking all the tax increment for 20 plus years. Okay. So, What's the lesson in that? Number one is nobody in St. Louis Park remembers how much money they spent <laughs> because they like the project, right? It, it, for the, you know, we can talk about whether the commercial was viable over a long time or not, but be, by and large, it worked. Why did it work also? Because the city had made a big investment in recreation next door and had upgraded that facility over a period of time. Um, why did it work? Well, it already, it already was a place that had a lot of restaurants, so they replaced a lot of restaurants. But at the same time, why did it work was because, um, as we said, they combined some of the issues of they knew what the vision was, they selected a good developer who was willing to adapt and the council was willing to adapt with that developer, so instead of falling in love with a project, they understood that this was a, you know, a journey that they were both on and trying to get it all built out. And at the same time, um, um, they knew what the residents were looking for, so it wasn't just a council-driven benefit, but the residents through a fairly long planning process that went on even before they bought the land. So every project has its problems. Um, some projects got lucky. There's a project up in St. In Saint, Saint Anthony John did a lot of work on. If you're familiar with the old Apache Plaza Mall that was up on Silver Lake Road, that project got lucky because it hit the market just at the right time. So the city really had very little risk. To be Brilliant involved with it? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Great plan. <laughs> All right. Not vertically mixed use, but a, a fair number. Anchored by what? Walmart. All right. So that's the reaction. So the first meeting I remember we had with John was everybody in St. Anthony said, we got this big mall, we're going to tear it down. Let's just build a bunch of other single family housing just like it's in St. Anthony. But the economics of that, even in St. Anthony, which is a pretty nice community, would have never worked. And the Walmart went in, which made the economics work on that. So we had some projects that got lucky timing-wise. We also have some projects where some cities took some risk. You know, Egan, you're hearing about um, a big outlet mall going on down in Cedarvale Mall, right on 77 and Highway 13. The city has sat on that land for a long period of time. But again, had a pretty good vision about what they wanted and um, have been adaptive in what the market is today. So, you know, there, that's another city, New Brighton's another example, up right on 35W and 694, where the city bought 100 acres of land on a highly visible site, and that has taken some time to develop. So what is the lesson in all of those other com communities is, um, number one, what I take away from the lesson is big, large redevelopments in today's new normal aren't gonna happen like that very much anymore. All right, we're gonna see much smaller 
You know, John talked about the grid system is something that's a benefit today. People don't have the kind of money to land bank either cities or developers. Two is um, developers, not only are there fewer of them, but they need more equity every time they have a project. So instead of getting by with 10 or 15% equity, now it's 30 to 35% minimum equity, right? Mm -hmm. So they're gonna go to the places where they have communities who are gonna be their partners and help share with some of that and help find ways to bring equity, which may mean, and I have spent most of my career trying to find ways for cities not to have to issue general obligation bonds like Jay was talking about in Loring Park, which may mean that cities have to go back to some of those days. But as we said, risk is not just a blanket bad thing. It can be quantified. So that's part of, I think, a longer answer to your question of what's the new normal mean? It means smaller projects, but it also means in more intense cooperation, both financially and vision-wise with communities and probably a little more patience, right? I, if I could tag on there, you, you know, the, one of the defining uh, moments in my career, I, I joined United Properties in 1990, uh, kind of the heart of the last Great Depression in real estate. And um, I wasn't involved in its inception, but we had this big project going at Centennial Lakes. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that we had um, had won the rights to develop, you know, this last great open site. Well, that that project, you know, could have taken our company under. I mean, it was it the, there was a tax increment plan that required the construction of a bunch of office buildings at a moment when the local experts were saying there was a 20-year supply of, of office buildings. Um, a couple of things made that work very well. One. Uh, the primary thing was that we did have a very effective public-private partnership. And Gordon knows a lot about that. I mean, it was that deal got reworked several times before it was able to move forward. But everybody was very focused on the market reality and and faced it and, and dealt with it. But but another piece I've been thinking about the mayor's question about you know what happens to these buildings downstream, and and to me maybe one of the great tests of a place is how adaptable it is and and to me you know the 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 great um, thing about an urban grid and about having projects that are a little bit more granular is that you have to especially today you have to <laughs> who was, was talking about the markets changing when we started Penn and American um, you know more than 10 years ago we had a very clear vision for what it was going to be and it and it was um, condominiums and, and um, commercial. Well, the condominium market went away, so um, there were several medical office users. We thought, gosh, that fits really well with this kind of commercial where we missed that window. Um, <laughs> it, it, the specialty office market went away, and then ultimately we found a partner who was able to do rental housing. But you have to, you have to sort of take a district view in um, what what made those projects work, and I think you know what what ultimately was the underlying strength behind the Excelsior and Grand site, and you know many of the places in Minneapolis and 50th and France is that that change happens in relatively small increments, and you, you can capture demand when it's when it's there and and build to that demand, and if you if if you have a really good project. Um, you know, we're already we've already seen the first phase of redevelopment of Centennial Lakes, and uh, you know the the movie theater got torn down when that building was was functionally obsolete, and and you know the the next generation came in. So I think it's a I think it's a complex uh, mix of things, but those fundamentals are you have to be ready to face. The market realities with your partners, and and in a in a problem solving mode. That doesn't mean that either side should take on all the risk, but you but you got to you got to do it together. And the other is is not to lose sight of all of those fundamental things that make places desirable, that make people want to to be there. So, you know, uh, proximity to employment, proximity to amenities and, and keeping parks good and keeping the schools good and making sure that there is continued reinvestment in the commercial district so that the goods and services that people want close to home are available. If you do all of those things, 
would be in a much better position to, um, uh, to, to capture whatever market demand exists at that time. I'm, I'm always shocked at how bad we are at, <laughs> at forecasting it. I mean, you know, the, the, every one of these, you know, Centennial Lakes, uh, you know, Penn and American, um, all the things that, that, you know, we look back and are the proudest of, turned out fundamentally differently than we, we planned when we started. Mentioned this a couple times now. I want to go back to Jay. When you were uh, redeveloping, were you part of the redevelopment of, uh, of Loring Park? You said that you mentioned that how you were able to do much of the things that you did was as a result of having um, amenities mm -hmm. there <laughs> existing, and that it. So how did the amenities get there? Well, the because um, it's it, Nicollet you know, Mall businesses was. Businesses don't want to go into a place where the demographics don't support them. But then you can't get the demographics to really support them without the businesses. So well, how did you handle that? The event? Nicollet Mall extension was done through special assessment of all the owners <clears throat> up and down Nicollet Mall, like they're looking at doing again. And the um, greenway that kind of goes off towards Loring Park was done with federal funds and tax increment funds. That so was the city did with general obligation bonds. The kickoff. So you had to establish that. But then we had to assemble parcels, too, because you had the if you remember way back then, there were all these little apartment buildings and things in there, and all the blocks were all cut up. There wasn't a grid system, so you had to reestablish kind of a street system as well. Let me shift. Yeah, kind of interested in the, uh, from listening to the panel discussion, from listening to what we have been talking about as a vision group here, uh, I think we, uh, I think what you're saying is that we better make sure that we take a good look at then and now. Because if we put too much emphasis on then, the then seemed to me to have been big and nice and had everything there, but it's just not going to be there. I mean, it doesn't mean that we don't have to have a big vision, but we might have to get it in pieces. And you might comment on that or tell me what's going on. Yeah, no, I completely agree. But, but when you look out, as Mark was talking about, don't looking out so far in advance, because yeah, statistics will tell you you can do anything. And I, you know, some of this stuff is really scary. I, I have lived for 25 years, three blocks from Loring Park. And um, when I bought my house, um, my wife wanted to live there. I thought, this is way too urban. Um, and, you know, I think about how my neighborhood has been transformed in, in that, over, over that time. Um, and it's, it's just fascinating. I remember, you know, the, for the first several years we lived there, um, there were still crime reports. I mean, we're, they would come and pick up dead bodies in, in Loring Park. This is three blocks from, you know, from, from where I live. Um, I never have experienced this, but I, but I have friends and neighbors who said that, you know, they remember hearing gunshots in that time frame on um, Lindale and Nicollet Avenues. Um, I remember when they built the bridge, the pedestrian bridge, mm -hmm. from the sculpture garden into Loring Park, and the, my neighbors all said, you know, this is going to ruin the place because those people can get over here. I'm like, well, <laughs> do you think that they can't walk across the street? But it's, it, you know, so that, you know, I think about the transformation of that place, um, you know, I think to a large degree, the gay community, you know, was the first group that came in, and mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of my neighbors would have said, boy, I sure hope you know, the gay community comes here, but, but all of a sudden it, it started to change and they started fixing up these old buildings. And, and in some ways the, the cheaper buildings, you know, were an asset because they could afford, you know, to get started there. Mm -hmm. and, and the other interesting thing about it has been that, I mean, there've been, there been a half a dozen kind of key elements. Uh, the, you know, there was a, an immigrant community um, that, that sort of repopulated Nicollet Avenue and turned it from, you know, really a crappy <laughs> commercial street into each street. And they put up lights and they cleaned up the trash and, and um, I mean, it was a remarkable transformation. Um, you see that on East Lake Street around the, uh, the Midtown Marketplace. That was a war zone back then. And today it's, you know, I ride my bike through there in the dark, you know, early in the morning and and think, think nothing of it. So it's uh, it's interesting. And, and, and in all of those places, diversity has been a huge asset. I mean, that's what, that's what, 
I mean, in my neighborhood, we, we, have, we have little kids, toddlers, you know, running around, and, uh, and retired people, and um, I mean, it, it's diversity across the full spectrum, and it makes it an interesting place to live. Let's shift gears a little bit, if we can, and get Matthias in the, the conversation. We, we talk quite a bit about Gen Y, and uh, we, we came to the realization, by the way, a, a workshop or two ago, that we talked a lot about Gen Y, but, they, but we had a bunch of 60-year-olds talking about <laughs> so, Gen Y, which didn't, you know, we should have thought of that a lot sooner. <laughs> um, Matthias, help us with this a little bit. First of all, we shared a lot of things about Gen Y, some of the community yeah. preferences they're looking for. Do you agree? I mean, the, what's your take on it? And, and yeah. then the next step, what, what could Richfield yeah. do to enhance attractiveness yeah. for that group? I do agree, though. I think that, um, I, don't, I don't think that it's necessarily something special about Gen Y that finds an allure in you know, mm -hmm. a place that's more walkable. I think that's just a universal thing. I think it's more that we kind of lost we lost sight of the allure of that, and I think Gen Y has regained sight of that, partly because they're, they're so mobile, and it's easy for them to um, move into a new environment and find that you know, they like, they actually like. That's kind of what happened to me. I grew up in Edina, and I you know, was weird to you know, believe that New York was a bad place, and I lived there for a little while, and I realized that it was a great place, and I think that's kind of one of the one of the things that's feeding that. I, I don't think it's necessarily something idiosyncratic of Generation Y. Um, I think as far as uh, you know, trying to attract people of a younger generation, I think one thing that would be really helpful is not so much to look at what other communities are doing that's good and successful, but to look at what other communities aren't doing because there's actually not a lot of housing, there's not a lot of diversity in the housing stock in my opinion. I've heard this a lot anecdotally over the last few years <clears throat> from people who are, who've moved here and are looking for a place to live and all they find are either apartments or single family and what they really want is something different, something unique, you know, maybe live work or co-housing or there's a lot of options that aren't really anywhere to be found, and I, I don't know if there's you know enough of a market for that or or not. But I, I think it's important not to be totally focused on trying to replicate somebody else's success because there are, I, I know there are niches out there that aren't being filled. So and and they're the they're the kind of niches that the younger generation wants. One of the things that <clears throat> bothers me is the we always talk about walkability and particularly for this generation we want walkability and yet in Richfield we talk about one of our uh, assets as being uh, location you can drive from anywhere and get here and one of the problems that we have is is that we do something and then suddenly we have a massive parking problem uh, you know, uh, the idea that we talk about walkability, but we don't build walkability yeah. uh, into yeah, this. Right. Uh, it, it's uh, quite a conundrum uh, for doing both housing yeah, and commercial right. development here. It, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, as, a, as a, somebody who <coughs> likes urban form development, I can tell you that that Parking and access are, are the commanding details. I mean, you know, we developed a 40-year vision for the Penn and American District that will probably take 75 years to realize because mm -hmm. it, it uh, you, you, if you're going to be viable in the market, you have, to, you have to meet the reality of the market um, today. It has to work today. You know, we can't, we can't build projects that will work, you know, 10 years from now, let alone. 75 years from now. When you now. say work from now, you mean pay off now or? Okay. They have to work for the, for the businesses that are, that are going to be there. And, um, and, and it's, it's a challenge. But, I mean, if you, if you look around, you, you see that it is happening, small increments, and, and with effective planning. You know, one of, the, one of the great opportunities will be that 
as cars get smaller and as some households, you know, as their transit system builds out and, and, and some households um, have fewer cars, um, the, the, there's an awful lot of paved um, space in our communities that could, could be used more intensively. And that's, that's one of the places we're going to end up reclaiming that land. Well, that, that, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the spaces and the paved spaces. I mean, look at what occurred during the 50s. We had massively big cars and much smaller garages. Today we have smaller cars and we're building more of them. And they're bigger. Uh, when, when people big up, build a house, they're building houses with three-car garages. Mm -hmm. but uh, you know, what, what you're saying that the generations want isn't matching what's being produced. This, this is a topic where I'll reverse my earlier position and say we should look 40 years out, OK? okay. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, I'm the oldest person amongst a huge number of Gen Xers who all graduated from the University of Michigan. All right, we go to a bar downtown and we watch Michigan football together. All right, of that gang who shows up, <coughs> hey, there's my other, okay, anyway, my fellow Wolverine. There's on big football Saturdays, there's 150, 200 young people there. The vast majority of them live in two places. They live in the North Loop, or they live in SLP in the West End. That's a hot place for them. That's the ones who work for General Mills or whatever. You have to go the other direction. But they love that urban feel, all right? A lot of them work for, for uh, Best Buy, and they reverse commute to Richfield. Amazing, because we don't have what they want here. Today, or yesterday, I live in, a, in a, a, a condo complex here in Richfield, which is a unique one. It is not a high rise. They're aplex buildings, all right? The buildings were built in 1980 and 1981. They have one garage, one car garages per unit. A young couple came to look at a unit right next to mine yesterday. They loved it. What happened? What did we do with our other car? They're Gen Xers. These, they were not 30 years old. Boom. What do they do with their <coughs> other car? So talking about so what you were talking about. And that's our problem is trying to deal with what space we have and perhaps building to the rest. That's, I have, that's, that's not your problem. But the fact of the matter is we do have to build what people want. Number three, in terms of walkability. Back in the early 90s, I was on the Hennepin County Community Health Services Advisory Board. And one thing we talked about ad nauseum was building sidewalks in new developments or looking at developed communities and adding sidewalks because people walk in the, have to walk in the street if they want to walk on a residential society. This, uh, this ankle will never be the same because I, had, I slipped on the ice uh, walking in the streets on 66, even on 66th Street, it was so bad. Boom. People who are living in our, in our community in Richfield who don't live on a street that has sidewalks, which is the vast majority of us, don't want to pay the extra assessment that they have to pay to have that. They'd like the sidewalk, but they're not going to pay for it. If the city is concerned and interested in being walkable, they make the investment in putting sidewalks in, at least on one side of the street um, for, uh, for every street in the city of Richfield. That will make us walkable. That will get people out of their cars, et cetera. You'll feel safer walking on the sidewalk than you will on the streets. It is a public safety issue to have sidewalks. 
look, the communities that have sidewalks have so many fewer pedestrian and bicycle uh, accidents and, and morbidity there than it, there's no comparison of the figures. Number four, I'm still not hearing us talk about Gen X as a total group. We talk about these Gen Xers as if everybody graduated from the University of Michigan and University of Minnesota. And they're making, they're, they're this urban thing that want to, think your high school grad, your tech school grad, your people who are working two jobs cannot afford those kinds of things. But can I, can I interject it? That's where I was going with my comment in, right. if, on that point. Kathy mentioned earlier one car costs how much per yeah. year? Yeah, Okay. And the point I was making is if you look 40 years down the line, um, when we talk about transit, Richfield has the opportunity of being a very close-in suburb, right? To be able to take advantage of the fact that long-term it's not sustainable for us to have the number of people that are going to live here and still have the highway system flow as well as it is, which means we're going to be like the rest of the metropolitan area, or all the other metropolitan areas around the country where we're going to have to use more transit, right? And so Richfield has that opportunity of being I'll go out on a limb here. Matthias talked about New York. What's the, the, what's the hottest place of development over the last 10 years for New York? It's not Manhattan. Brooklyn. It's Brooklyn. Oh, I live right? in Brooklyn. So yeah. why can't Richfield be in that same why can't Richfield be in that same vein? So one of the questions is we can't force that to happen. It's, you know, that's going to happen over a gradual period of time. But you know, what you've done, and I some, sometimes get this sense from Richfield that you beat up yourself a little too much. Because if you drive up and down Lindale and 66, and I challenge you to go to, and I'm going to pick on some places that I even work for, West St. Paul, South St. Paul, Robbinsdale, Crystal, First Ring Suburbs, I would hazard a bet that most of them would be really happy to have 66th in Lindale in their community. So the fact that you've made some investments, they've paid off over a period of time, if you continue to make those investments, you're a more likely place to have the benefit of being that transit-oriented kind of, and sidewalks is a good example. I don't think there's another first-tier sub suburb that's done a better job of retrofitting their housing stock either. Um, this kind of fits a lot of different, but we just built a house in Richfield, and we are the Gen Xers, and we built a house with a two-car garage, though we have one car. Um, and we are the ones that decided to spend more and build in Richfield rather than go down to Savage because I only work two miles away and I can commute by foot for bike. Um, on the sidewalk note, um, I find it very, being that I commute by foot or bike, um, I appreciate Richfield's bike lanes more than sidewalks. Just in the sense of winter commuting, even by foot, sidewalks are never clear. I mean, I'm safe by Best Buy, but beyond that, there's, there's always spots for injury. My husband sprained his ankle, um, luckily in Bloomington's side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, it, sidewalks are really unsafe, so he was following state law, running against traffic, and a car got mad and swerved towards him because they don't believe that we belong on the streets. And so, though sidewalks make things nice at times. I personally broke my foot on a sidewalk because there's a hole in it. So there's that maintenance piece. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, but, right, but you know, the bike lanes offer a nice, a nice balance because you can do some sort of bikes. But in the winter, I mean, as a runner, I will use the bike lane if it's safer. And it doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, but I think that's what's really going to make Richfield attractive to Gen X if that's what we're talking about, is the ability, not necessarily um, the need or the have to, but the option to commute and the option to have a two-car garage so that half of it can be um, storage or a workshop where I can have a tool bench finally. I mean, it's those, those items that for my family are really key and critical but offer a good quality of life. Yes, I didn't. Yeah, you've been patient in the back. I was <laughs> make sure that I was engaging other people. Um, no, I just wanted to bring up, kind of go back to housing. Um, you talked about the Stantec report, identified uh, that there was a need that our, talked about our rental housing here, and that our rental housing.
housing is substantially old um, and lacks amenities that uh, young urban professionals look for. Um, and, and that there's a need to, for housing that has uh, amenities that would attract young urban professionals. And I guess it's a two-part question is what can we do to get more housing like that in here, rental housing for young urban professionals, and then also retrofitting our aging older apartment buildings. Some of them are in great shape. You know, the apartment managers are doing a very good job. Some of them are entering the next circle of hell. Um, you know, but uh, it, how do we, you know, how do we address those? Yeah. Let's let's ask the address that second question first. I don't know if, if, if John or Jay, if you have any thoughts. Are there are there resources out there and available for for uh, you know these uh, large developments, large rental developments that need some work. I, my daughter and her husband, they're both 25, just moved out of the project on Lindale, just north of the big project, just north, a couple blocks north of 494 on the east side of Lindale. I can't remember what, yeah. what it's called, but I'm envisioning that kind of a development, the all one bedroom, narrow yeah. corridors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and you, I have been involved in retrofitting and redeveloping those kind of projects, but it, it takes a real strong partnership because not only do you have to think of the housing stock, you have to think of the people who live there today and where are they going to live as well as the people who you're going to attract to move in and how you manage that mixture, that combination of um, what to do with the plywood palaces. And it's, um, it, 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 it's what we were all talking before. It's, gonna, it's not going to be an easy project to get done. It's going to take a while to get it done and it's going to be controversial because anytime you're quote, displacing people, um, and somebody doesn't want to move, it's, it's a real challenge. I know Cedar Square West, when they re in our redoing it, um, they set aside a certain portion as what they call a hotel, so that they would move people out, put them in this section, renovate, move them back. Um, and so they would do, they'd do a lot of that. So but, but those kind of renovations, we do that too, where yeah. we go in and we actually don't have to move people now. We can do a substantial rehab and never displace the resident. Yeah. But you're, you're going from a one-bedroom to a one-bedroom, two-bedroom to a two-bedroom. The challenge is to take a 30-unit one-bedroom building and convert it to something that's lofts or something that uh, is marketable today. And that's a lot more exhaustive than what Cedar Square West went through. Are there any success stories out there, Jay, that you could, that we could... With the, I'd have to think about specific locations. I can't remember, but, but it has been done where they converted one bedrooms to, and some of it involves demolition, you know, because some of those buildings are, you know, they're so tight in there, there's not enough room to move around. So when all is said and done, you're, you'll end up with maybe half the units that you start with, but then they're completely different. Yeah, when you have quads and duplexes, it's not financially feasible right. to do any major renovation. You have to go down a little bit. Yeah. That's very complicated. That, that term actually is, is quite intriguing, financially feasible. It, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not worth it. There's no money to be made. What's the bottom line? Where's the threshold? What is it that's worth it to do? Uh, what gets you interested in doing one of those renovations as a percentage of the cost per square foot, uh, the return on that? What is it that, that really, where, where is your your threshold of interest. I'm not sure there's a specific, there's not a really a specific number. A lot of times you do a project more based on feeling than you do, I mean, you do all sorts of numbers till the cows come home. But when it gets down to it, you look at those numbers and you say, can I really achieve that? And, and to do a renovation of what we're talking about now, you really need that, like Mark was talking about, those kind of projects, you really need a public-private, absolutely strong partnership to get that done because Every time you do a sub rehab, when I did them in Minneapolis, your best pro forma was the one you closed with because the only thing that happened from then on was all bad. As soon as you open up a wall, there's surprises. And, 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 and the cost of doing that and having a partnership, um, you know, you, you really need somebody to help underwrite the overall project. And to really be, and you got to be, um, it's not for the faint of heart. So there, there's three models that you can follow. One is Brooklyn Park, you know, had similar, obviously, property, the old Harvin Mark property. And they just spent city dollars to de-intensify it, yeah. right? So the city just spent money to tear some of it down. 
The second is a number of communities have done rehab, but that largely requires that the project becomes, if not all, <laughs> at least majority uh, income restricted. Okay. So, yeah, but that's where the money is. I mean, that's where, so you can still get money out of the federal government, you can still get money out of the state government, but in exchange for that, they're going to require oftentimes 100% affordability, right? Which is great if that's what you're looking for. The third is to build the um, comparable rents in the area high enough that those existing owners say, this is a really good idea for me to invest my money so I can get the return off of the higher comparable rents. So that's, that's the way that lets the market handle it. It's just that you're going to have to probably help those pioneers that Jay talked about to bring in a new product to be able to raise the bar on what people think we can get for rents in Richfield. I know it's not solace, but um, you're not alone <laughs> with this problem. Uh, talk to your counterparts in Hopkins, a uh, very similar situation. Brooklyn Park, notwithstanding this project, Roseville. Um, you, you could create a little uh, consortium of cities that have this identical situation. But, uh, well, and another opportunity is because of the restriction of converting one bedrooms to two bedrooms, just the difficulty in doing that is a lot of these older complexes have are maybe over parked. And is there a way to add density in those over parked sites that maybe would add a two or three bedroom unit component that then could help the feasibility of renovating the one bedrooms to be a higher quality product that then extends the life of that whole area? The, the problem, I, 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 I Or, or you could do like a townhome on Stand. any, you know, there's other models. I think the Richfield added a two or three level townhomes mm -hmm. with on the parking structure area, or not structure, on the parking area of a four or five um, rental complexes with probably 22 units each that were kind of situated oriented, which were mostly one bedrooms and maybe a couple two bedrooms. They couldn't figure out how to convert them, so they added some product, different product on site, and then were able to get money to renovate the existing, so that the whole project was a nicer, cohesive project. So You know, the problem that, that we've seen with some of these projects, honestly, that renovated one bedrooms to three bedrooms, is nobody's living in the three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Well, you know why that is? Wouldn't you rather rent a house yeah. if you have a family than a three bedroom, right? So, I mean, they, we sometimes outsmart ourselves in that situation. Yeah. Just my comment, I guess, too, is that if you're gonna do the renovations, if you're gonna um, be adapting mm -hmm. one bedrooms to three bedrooms, the price automatically is gonna go up. And unfortunately, the residents who are currently living here then are going to be tossed out because a lot of our residents are people who are in um, the, the statistics that were shown before and aren't, are barely earning enough to pay rent on the, on the dilapidated uh, buildings that we have now. So what do we do with those residents is another question that we need to consider as we're going through this visioning. So. Well, I'm glad to sneak this question into Matthias. When, when, when you were talking about housing types uh, during your talk, you used the term work-live, and actually that term really kind of piqued my interest. Uh, back in 2008, we had a task force which was looking at the Penn and 66 area that came up with design guidelines. And that concept was actually lightly touched upon in some of the community forums we have with the idea of uh, a type of housing that, you know, maybe you have a business on street level, and you live on the second level. Um, is there any of that type of housing being developed in the Twin Cities or nationally? I, I don't know, but I, uh, I don't know about here. I, I'm not aware of any, but in other cities I've lived in, it's a pretty common development and it's very uh, attractive. And I had friends who lived in such places and ran galleries down, you know, down low, and friends who lived in places and, and didn't do any of that. I mean, that's also very common. People just want, you know, that kind of, uh, Space. yeah, but they don't necessarily need to work in the work portion of it. It does seem like an interesting concept, I think. 
Well, it, it, and there's another twist on that is that the, the percentage of people working at home in a home that's not in a commercial environment. I mean, I think live work is very much alive, um, but it's just, it's not always in that, what you think of as that storefront yeah, with right. the shop right. under yeah. the, under the uh, apartment. Yeah. Several of the projects that we looked at when we were on the tour demonstrated the difficulty of filling some of those first floor mm -hmm. retail spaces. And so that, there were some of those having the versatility of letting people live in there that didn't work for retail or until the retail market matured. Well, and if you look around Richfield, the, the, the new developments, they're still having a lot of trouble, right. you know, filling the retail spaces, mm -hmm. not just old, but brand new. You know, we own a business as well, looking at moving into this community. The funny thing about it is the perception of the business community of vendors shy away from coming into this community because it's not a viable community to support I'm not sure what your perception on that is. But I don't think you can judge that. When I was in Minneapolis, I cannot think of a project we ever did in Minneapolis over 20 years where the first floor retail made financial sense, yeah. uh, including Loring Park, including uh, everything on Hennepin Avenue, Laurel Village. None of that ever penciled out. And, and I don't know about Excelsior and Grand. You know, they may subsidize the rental rates, but it's... We, we, our company will not do a housing project with retail on the first floor. I know, I know in Seattle, at least when I was there, it was a mandate that all, all uh, multifamily housing had to have that mm -hmm. street level retail and I don't think that any of the developers liked it, but mm -hmm. it ended up actually getting filled and sometimes it was filled by, you know, dental offices rather than a corner grocery, but it did end up, it did end up working well for the community. I don't know if it was the most profitable thing for the developer. I think it's risky. I mean, we did it at Penn and American, and it appears to be working very well. Um, we have had much better success. Um, it has been, I shouldn't say that, because it's, you know, that it's not like one success is better than another, but it's, it, it increases complexity and risk and not in a linear way. Um, it, it, if, if you get it wrong, um, you know, if the structural grid is, is wrong or, you know, the, the loading doesn't work or the parking doesn't work, now you've got empty commercial space under your, your cool residential project and it's a blight. Um, it, you know, the model at Centennial Lakes worked much better where, it, where it's Definitely a mixed-use project, but it's horizontal, not not vertical. Um, I think it can work. I think there are a lot of places that we all love where where it does work, but it's it's way harder and way riskier. And um, you know, we should all be looking for ways to reduce risk. How much is that to the economic downturn, though, since 2007? I mean, is that a? Because I, I was reading about an article about that. And a lot of that is not so much related to development, but rather the economics where a lot of the businesses just simply can't take place. I'm going to get Kensington Park as a great example. There are businesses and they have the economic downturn happen, and they park them, they all have the bridge, and poof. Well, Ken Kensington's a special case. I mean, I think there, that is more horizontal mixed use, and I think there's clearly demand for that space. Um, it goes back to our earlier discussion about parking being the commanding detail. I mean, there's space there that um, where, where there is commercial demand for the space, but where there's insufficient parking for it to work. And um, that, that was the miss there. But not that the, I mean, there, there is absolutely demand for that space. It's good, good commercial space. Well, Mayor, we're close to over, overstaying our welcome here. I'd like to give you the last word, but I'm, I'm going to jump in with a couple quick things before I do that. Uh, part of your handout tonight is what we call the Redevelopment Ready Guide, and uh, it's something that ULI Minnesota has put together um, to provide some assistance for uh, cities readying uh, sites for redevelopment or development, and please take a, a look at that. Secondly, we send out, uh, I think you'll all receive by email in the next couple days a survey about the workshop. Please give us some feedback about uh, whether it was worthwhile for you and uh, whether there are any 
changes that you could uh, could recommend to us. And again, you'll be seeing that in a couple of days. But Mayor, I'll give you the last word if you have. Well, first, I'd like to thank you for 